Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center's special edition of Greater Somerville. I'm Joe Lynch. Our guest today is the Massachusetts Democratic Party endorsed candidate for lieutenant governor, the current mayor of Salem, Kim Driscoll. First elected to the Salem City Council in 1999, Mayor Driscoll won the mayor's race in 2005 and has served in that capacity ever since. Kim Driscoll also served in municipal government in Chelsea and Beverly, is the past chair of the North Shore Coalition of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and served on the Mass Mayors Association and the United States Conference of Mayors. Kim is a graduate of Salem State, lives in Salem with her family, and I am so pleased to welcome the candidate for Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. We're here in Somerville. The former mayor, Joe Curtatoni, always had me address him as Excellency. <laughs> I find that very hard to believe. If, if it's good for you, I will address you as Kim. Please, I would Thank prefer you. it. <laughs> Congratulations, first and foremost, on the endorsement from the Mass State Party. The convention was held two weeks ago now? Yeah, it feels like uh, like two years ago in some ways and yesterday in others, but it was and great. Knowing how these constitutional office seekers operate, you were on the road within 12 hours after that. We took five minutes to go, woohoo, and then it was like right back to work. But Congratulations. And I also noticed that our current mayor, Katiana Ballantyne, and former mayor, Joe Curtitoni, have also endorsed you. I'm very blessed. They're both terrific colleagues. I've known Joe for a number of years and have really enjoyed getting to know Katiana and the work she's doing here. I think we have a lot of alignment, so grateful to have their support. Terrific. For the viewers, um, why don't you take a few more minutes, to talk about your background, where you are and how you see the role of lieutenant governor should you be successful. Yeah, I feel so fortunate to be uh, mayor of Salem. I've been in that role for the last 16 years, as you noted. Uh, when I first came into office, you know, we had a lot of struggles. Salem was not, uh, you know, not necessarily performing at the rate that we knew we could, had all these amazing assets. And for the last 16 years, we've worked really hard to sort of polish off our community, improve our finances, enhance city services. And today, 16 years later, Salem is a hip, historic, vibrant destination, you know, third most visited destination in Massachusetts, a place that is soon to be a clean energy hub, has really uh, prided itself on transforming, you know, what's happening in our community. Uh, for a city that's nearly 400 years old, uh, you know, you're always looking to make sure we're thinking about the future while also really proud of the past that we have here. I know that the experience of a local leader is one that, you know, can be all consuming, but I also know that you need a strong state partner to be successful whether it's investments in infrastructure, working on strengthening affordable housing. You know, a mayor's role is on the ground every single day in the trenches. There's no hiding. There's direct accountability. You're making decisions, frankly, for neighbors and friends and people you're going to see the next day. I think it tends to make you a better leader because you have that direct accountability with folks. And, and so you've got to explain why you've made a decision. You've got to listen more. Um, I like to say I'm part of the get stuff done wing of government, and I'm hoping to bring that skill set, that sense of urgency, and that sense of accountability to the State House to partner with our next governor and do good things for communities. No city or town, even one with amazing assets like the city of Somerville, can really make it alone. And the, so many of the issues and challenges that we have in the Commonwealth, um, we need action at the local level to really address them. Um, cities like Salem, I think, are a microcosm of those challenges. I've been able to work in ways to help strengthen housing, address school issues, work towards improving infrastructure. And I think that experience and skill set can be a strong partner to our next governor. And that's why I'm interested in this role. I want the, the strength and uh, vibrancy of our communities to be a key issue, and I can champion that as a lieutenant governor. I promised you no gotcha questions. Sure. But here's the most important question of the campaign. All right the best city in the Commonwealth to live, work, and play, Salem or Somerville? <laughs> oh. Well, I feel like half of Somerville is relocating to Salem. I, you know, I used to kid Joe Touché, that we're being Touché. Somervilleized. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think there's actually a lot of similarities amongst our communities, you know, dense, populated places that want vibrancy. I say hip historic. I know Joe was, would say, you know, funky and curious, and uh, places that are striving to get better, that aren't going to settle with how they currently are. And that can be bumpy, too, you know. Sure, um, change and, is always yep. uncertain, and it causes a little bit of an anxiety level. But, you know, all of us within municipal government have to be able to market and brand and attract new residents, infrastructure changes, um, dollars from the state yeah. and the feds, and business. 
I mean, that's what role, the role of the chief marketing officer is. So, and if you want a vibrant community, like those things, all need to be menus on the table. We're not a sleepy suburban bedroom community to Boston. We're a city, and so is Somerville. And I think there's that means that we, you know, need to embrace some of the opportunities that we have before us. And like I said, it can be a little bumpy, but we also have lots of talented people in our communities that exactly. I want to give back and give in and make their voices heard. So I appreciate it. But when you become lieutenant governor, it's no longer kind of like that sort of myopic that this mm -hmm. is my community. You now have 350, how many do we have? 351. 351 right. cities and towns and sleepy villages that we all have to watch out for. When Before we go into this, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> Salem or Somerville, I mean, we know. Um, for But for both cities, Mayor, if it's you can if you can afford to live there. So I just want to slide into affordable housing right across the Commonwealth. I mean, even some people in the sleepy villages of the Berkshires are feeling the impact of the housing crunch. So if you want to take a little bit, talk about your approach mm -hmm. on Beacon Hill to affordable housing. Yeah, I mean, it's the number one issue that I'm hearing about, not just in my own community, um, but across the Commonwealth. Even in places where housing is more affordable, it's not more affordable to the people living there. And I think as a Commonwealth, I'm really worried about our competitiveness um, with young adults really feeling like they, there isn't a home here for them or they're not going to be able to afford to buy a home in the place they grew up or the place they work. Um, for me, it's also a moral issue. Like having safe and secure housing is, should be a right that everyone can enjoy. Um, and too often that's not the case in so many of our communities. Um, we've approached it in Salem by starting with a housing production plan, really trying to drill down and understand who is being served by housing, what's contributing to the housing shortage in our community. And as it turns out, like we're all living longer. Great. But there's putting pressure and crunch on the housing inventory that's available. And then you throw in communities that do have vibrancy, walkable, urban environments. A lot of people want to live in those places. You also need that service sector, and there's where the real crunch is happening, I think, in my community and so many others, where folks are working hard, sometimes one or two jobs, pouring coffee, pouring beer for a living, anything that you do that's over a counter. We need those folks in our community, and yet they can't afford to live there. Um, so this housing production plan helped really put an exclamation point on that. When you say no to new housing, you're hurting your child care providers, you're hurting your teachers, you're hurting the folks in your community who you want to help the most, and you're making it harder to age in place or for young adults to buy or stay in the community. Now, we don't want just the market to drive housing, so what's the role that a community can take on? Cities don't typically build housing. We've looked at leveraging public land, thinking about how we could use community land trust, uh, working closely with our own affordable housing trust, and also, how do we embrace density? We want housing that looks good, you know, that's passive construction, that has a component of affordability. Um, well, you've got to make sure that you're allowing for the market also to ensure that you're, you know, you're thinking about having more units added so that you can get some more community benefit out of it. Do you, um, I'm sorry, Kim, do you see a day when the feds will come back into the house, public housing arena or are they just you no, know, I hope so, but right now, I mean, they went to the tax credit business. You don't see HUD building projects the way they did in the 70s. They've moved on. And how do we, you know, secure more of those? I do feel like we have been a community that's supportive of supportive housing models, converting some of our housing authority properties, reinvesting in them, and enhancing the number of units. And I also think we want to be a place that's also tackling the issue for folks who are living in our communities now. Because people are moving to Salem, really appreciate it. We're seeing the naturally occurring affordable housing, also known as the dumpy apartments I lived in when I was in college. Those are getting snatched up, right? So, um, you know, are there you know rights of first refusal? Are there ways that we can help existing tenants who are feeling the pressure of displacement, and also that there isn't an opportunity for them in what's being constructed and, and is new? And if we're creating new affordable housing, which we are proponents of, housing authority, nonprofit housing partners, CDCs, we're really aggressive in working with those partners, leveraging public land for more of that. Um, but if we're losing you know other properties that are the naturally occurring housing, we're not really getting a net gain in affordability. So that's where housing production plans really drilling down on these issues. And I think the state can be a strong, stronger partner when it comes to um, opportunities for leveraging public land and really cleaning out the low-income housing uh, credit pipeline that currently exists. So many of us have projects that are permitted and ready to go, but are waiting on that pipeline um, of, of tax credits to come to, come to fruition. Part of the role of the lieutenant governor can 
play? I definitely think we can influence housing. I do think uh, the current administration with housing choice legislation has really worked hard to put an exclamation point on the need for housing. How do we amplify that going forward? We all need to be housing champions. If, no matter where you're living, if you are not supporting housing to meet your community needs, you're only hurting your community, your young adults, folks who want to age in place. And that's not good for the Commonwealth, especially when you can you can work here and live anywhere. Um, right. And so it could risk our competitiveness as well. Major topic is the environment, climate change. Mm. You are, were the mayor, uh, or the mayor of a coastal community. Talk a little bit about some of the initiatives, some of the things that worries you about climate change and how we're going to make a change. Yeah, I mean, I really see it as a climate crisis. Um, Salem is a coastal community, so we see rising sea levels, you know, very specifically and happening, you know, over, year over year getting worse and worse. Um, we have worked with the city of Beverly on a climate action plan. We felt like we had these strong legislative goals, much like the Commonwealth does, but how are we really going to achieve them? What's the backwards mapping that we need to do to achieve net zero by 2050 or reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030 or sooner? Um, so this climate action plan really uh, did two things. One, it gave us an assessment of what is contributing to our greenhouse gas emissions. To no one's surprise, transportation and buildings. Those are the two biggest you know, contributors to GHD in most of our communities. But then it also put together a to-do list that had us looking at what can we do to help reduce our greenhouse gas emissions? What can we do to um, think about building more resiliently? What can we do to increase energy efficiencies within our community? That was the goal of the Green Communities Act. Way back when, under Governor Patrick, we were one of the first green communities, was reduce efficiencies. And we haven't met the mark as a commonwealth fully yet. Really good programs, lots of opportunities, things that Salem's done and, and Somerville's done. Converted our streetlights to LED, you know, changed our, high, our fleets of cars and vehicles. Um, you know, done municipal aggregation so that we're buying 100% renewable power, anyone who's generating electricity in Salem who's part of our program. But there's so much more that we need to do. So this climate action plan will help us both with mitigation and adaptation strategies. We've done a lot of piloting of projects, living shorelines, thinking about how we uh, use our municipal vulnerability plan, items that we know where they're going to flood. We can't seawall our way out of it, so how are we adapting as things are as expecting rising seas to happen? Um, and then thinking about building more resiliently and converting new buildings. And the last piece I'll just say is we have leaned in hard on transportation. We're only eight square miles. We're a place that you can be walkable. How do we support the infrastructure for it? And encourage people to get rid of their cars with ride share service, 65,000 rides through, through Salem Skipper, a car share service, get around. You don't need a car. We want to be a car light, -like, car optional community. And obviously a bike share program to give alternatives for people to get around without a car. I want to get into the, one of the major components, which is transportation. Transportation, public yeah. transportation, private transportation, how all of this weaves itself together. But as one of the chief marketeers mm -hmm. for programs that the city, the, the state will want to accomplish, how do you convince municipalities like Burlington mm -hmm. or Springfield yep. that they should stop building parking garages right. or huge swaths of five acre parking lots right. for their malls? Right. How do you do that within, should you be successful, you're going to be working with, I'm going to assume here, you're going to be working with another female in the top job. I hope so, right? Um, we've, got, so we've got some quality candidates, that's for sure. How do you set forth that sales plan to convince yeah. these other municipalities it's not just an issue of Salem yep. or of Boston with their air quality or because they may lose harbor land? How do you convince them? You know, I think a lot of it is happening in communities um, already. You know, in Burlington, they actually do have a shuttle service bringing in workers into Burlington, uh, the restaurants, the malls that are there uh, from Lowell. So they've, folks are trying to embrace innovation, and we've come a long way using technology, these Uber-based platforms, Uber and Lyft-based platforms for uh, shared ride services, for systems that you're not tied to a bus schedule. Like, that doesn't work for a lot of people. It works for some, but not for a lot. And uh, opportunities that we can make it easier and convenient to use public transit, um, then, then that's the way that we're going to be able to rid ourselves of less cars. I don't think that we're talking about taking cars 100% off the road, knowing that there are drivers and lifestyles and places that people need to go, knowing that we have Uber and Lyft and things like that and Amazon and you know contributing to more cars on the road. But where do we push in for public transit options? And you're seeing malls are starting to convert to add housing. Mm -hmm. They're talking about mixed-use development, lifestyle-style communities and villages. And a natural component to that is, well, what's the transportation demand 
demand management look like? Less parking, more opportunities to get there through shared transportation alternatives. And the sharing economy, I think, is something that's really coming into its own. Your, your car sits in your driveway a lot of the times when you really think about it, and it's a car that needs to be paid for and maintained and insured and gassed up. But you know, maybe there's a way that you share your car. That's our get around platform with, with car sharing. I think there's opportunities for us to uh, become more of a car light community, but only if we really push hard in on the public transit alternatives. And that's going to take money and subsidies. They're not inexpensive, but they can work if we make it convenient and we incentivize it. You're sitting in one of three communities that just received a huge infusion of public transportation money for the Green Line. Right. A $3 billion project that everyone said it'll never get built. But then the advocates said, but we have to build it. They didn't take no for an answer. Right. So you have Cambridge, Somerville, Medford, who are now going to be uh, realizing the benefits of that. Along with that, this is how it all weaves itself in. You know this, the housing crunch right. is a direct result of people want to be near public transportation. You instituted something in Salem, I think, with the rehab of the commuter rail mm -hmm. stop up there. Yep. If you make things convenient, affordable, and accessible to them, they'll do it. That's correct. And that has consequences. It does. So transportation-wise, I hope we get to a day where public transportation is how we all do nine to five. And the pandemic has taught us that our job models will have to change very, very quickly. And I just kind of think to myself, where are all those high rises going to go in downtown Boston when people can work out of the home office? Right. Your issue, should you be successful, is to figure that out. Um, I want to move into one other area where uh, municipalities, you're very keenly aware of municipalities, depend a lot on state funds. Mm -hmm. As lieutenant governor, working with a new governor, where can municipalities get more money out of the state? Yeah, we need to have a partnership that's working a little bit harder for municipalities. You know, the biggest bucket of money that cities and towns get is typically tied to schools through Chapter 70 funding. We get another decent sized bucket in something called Chapter 90 money that's geared towards fixing up roads, providing equipment to maintain roads. Um, and a lot of our communities are seeing declining enrollment. F folks are having less kids, and that's hurting the formulas in terms of how they can support community schools. Um, it doesn't cost less to heat a building if you have less kids in it, so those resources really matter. We know the state has historic dollars coming in, and I think the legislature has really strived to look at things like the Student Opportunity Act to help communities. But one size fits all is not working everywhere. So that partnership, if we have historic resources coming in, how do we share more of that with municipalities where you know, we have the biggest impact on the quality of life? Cities and towns, local government, are, are the government you rely on to educate your kids, keep your neighborhood safe, invest in those places you make memories, right? From beautiful parks and beaches to infrastructure and systems you rely on, uh, water, sewer, et cetera. Um, right now, uh, that model is broken for many places, despite really good efforts from the legislature. And I think we need to encourage a conversation around what's a partnership look like? If we have historic resources coming in, how do we make sure the small hill towns out in central and western Mass, who are really feeling the squeeze, you know, have some access to dollars? Um, you know, urban communities who have done pretty well through Student Opportunity Act, but are still struggling with some of the, the high cost of educating students, having a lot of income, inequality that exists within your community that leads to higher costs in a number of areas. I think that's a conversation that we need to engage in with state leaders, both in the legislature and in the administration, and municipal leaders who can understand. You can't say no to growth and then say the state's not giving me enough. So it needs to be a true partnership with cities looking to embrace opportunities for housing and growth within their communities to help support uh, some of the work that we know we have to do going forward. And that can also help their bottom line and our state's needs, uh, whether it's housing, mixed use, and the like. I'm just going to make a giant assumption here that you probably know better than most people running for elective office the trials and tribulations of being a chief executive running a municipality and being answerable to the mm -hmm. voters. Mm -hmm. One of the things that keeps coming up, Kim, is transparency of government. How do we respect the right to privacy for some of our electeds, but at the same time be accountable to the public by being totally transparent. Right. That's a balancing act. Yeah, I mean, I think. L does the role of the lieutenant governor have anything to do with that type of trying to be the traffic cop between how much information is too much information, trying to respect the privacy? 
I mean, from my perspective, I think uh, those of us who operate in local government are used to being open and communicative because these are constituents that we know. It's, they're not anonymous people. Uh, they're folks who are not, not only your supporters, they're folks who didn't support you. I don't think everyone agrees with every decision coming out of City Hall, but I think they trust that we're going through a process that entails listening, that entails coming to a conclusion or a decision that has the best interest of the community in mind. So even if they disagree with the outcome, there's that basic you know, belief and trust that, well, they're, they're trying to do the best they can. There's a healthy dose of skepticism sometimes around state government, and frankly, you know, even more so, I think, when you talk about Washington, and is it really working for me? And I, I do think there's opportunities working with the next governor to ensure we're, we're thinking about programs that affect people's quality of life every day. Right now, coming out of COVID, we're in this, well, hopefully coming out of COVID, right, we're in this next phase. And we're not going back to the way we did things before, and we're certainly maybe not going to do, do everything the way we're doing it right now. It's still a little messy. Um, going forward, what does that look like? Um, there were a lot of folks who came through this pandemic who their wallets weren't impacted, their pocketbooks weren't impacted. They did okay. Um, but there's a whole other sector of our population who are really hurting. We're already a high-cost state. You add in you know, rising gas rates, rising food costs, utility costs are up, and people aren't going to be able to make ends meet. I think we're in for some choppy waters. It's even more incumbent upon us to be communicating about what we can do, what we are doing, what we're listening to, what we're hearing, how we're trying to respond. And even if people don't agree with all of the tactics, the strategies, if they know that we're doing, we're acting in a way that's designed to help them, um, I hope it can make the difference. That's sort of the, the sort of lens that I hope to be able to bring to the discussion. I'm not going to be the key decision maker. We have a governor, um, but I hope to be able to help influence some of the conversation that's happening going it forward. It has always been a case if people understand and they understand what's at stake, mm. it might be a little bit harder to sell to get them on board, but eventually they get there. Right. Um, Pre-pandemic, a lot of us were talking about social and racial, racial justice. Some people said, well, that's going to go away during the pandemic. Quite the contrary. No. It heightened our awareness of social and racial justice. The role the lieutenant governor could play with, say, the attorney general or other members of the legislature on that. Your thoughts? I mean, I think we need to be centering equity in all that we do. Um, it's an important consideration if we're serious about, um, you know, Massachusetts taking advantage of the horsepower of the people who live here. We can't have some of the people who live here uh, feeling marginalized, underrepresented, or having systems that are by their very nature holding people back. Um, so in my estimation, I think that's going to have to be key, whether we're talking about any role in government at any level. This is something that we can't stand for. Um, you know, we are, have always been a place, I think, in Massachusetts um, that strives um, to deliver values for everyone in a way that meets, you know, the needs of people who live here. We are a commonwealth. We're not a state. There are places that are states. We're a commonwealth. Now, there's no legal distinction. I do think it comes from the idea that we're going to work for the common good. And right now, there's a lot of folks who don't feel like the systems are working for them. And we need to listen and we need to respond. I don't think we need to throw all the systems out the window. I think we need to understand what parts are broken, That's right. what parts we fix. There may be some anti antiquated pieces yeah. of the system that you need to just pull out and get rid of. But Agree. I agree. History could be made this November in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that we could have for the first time two women in the top two constitutional offices. Very important question. Should we anticipate a new basketball court being installed at the State House? Your thoughts? <laughs> well, I am a hoop player. I know you are. So, um, you know, I think depending on what happens at the primary, we could just have a game of horse for the whole thing in November. <laughs> Save a lot of money on elections, right? Put it right out there. Um, I'm, I love basketball. Basketball was my first love. Like, I think it's an amazing sport. And uh, I say more hoop courts every place we can put them. Although I have transferred over to pickleball now. I'm more of a pickleball aficionado. I've got to try it. Uh, I've got to try it. People are forcing sport. me into it. But back on to a serious level, yeah. you had touched on this before about transportation. Um, the MBTA has been in the news lately and not necessarily in a good way. Um, Public transportation is a critical component in battling climate crisis. Taxpayers demand reliable, clean, safe, and modern transportation systems. The metro Boston area depends on the T. The rest of the state is looking for it as well. Your thoughts on that? 
I mean, I will say to you, when you're in other places of the Commonwealth, they do not believe that trans public transit begins and ends with MBTA, right? There are regional transit authorities that also need to serve needs. Now, there's a large segment of the population that certainly is in uh, the greater Boston area who relies on it. Salem has the busiest commuter rail station in the entire MBTA system. And you have an active port system. We do. There. We also bought our own ferry, so we, uh, you know, we want to find as many ways. And frankly, I think there's opportunities to expand water transportation. How many other coastal metropolitan cities don't have access into them via the water, no potholes, no traffic jams, a great way to get people in. Now, that's not going to solve our transit issues. We have a, an opportunity for east-west rail. We're building rail into the south coast, into New Bedford. So I think there's an understanding that uh, the development of rail can bring people into the city. But I also think there needs to be an understanding that we don't want whole regions of our commonwealth beholding to the city of Boston for their economic success. So we need to find ways that we can have better regional opportunities in Holyoke, in Worcester, in Springfield, in Pittsfield, in places that feel a bit neglected. And transportation is going to be key to that effort as well. So it can't just be uh, public transportation rises and falls around the MBTA. I mean, there are some safety challenges that need to be addressed. It needs to be reliable. Not the, that's just not the T. That is everywhere we're operating public transit. How do we brace, embrace technology? Knowing that the old way of buses and people working eight to five, five days a week is not the way people go to work today. Um, and how do we think about supporting that from a state level perspective? Sometimes that's technical assistance. Sometimes that's resources. A lot of times it's that scaffolding and that networking that frankly local communities in concert with their regional transit agencies and hubs can work together to both improve. You know what's happening in your community and what those needs are. We all operate, many of us, not all, many operate COA vans. Um, we have school buses. Like, How do we think about an integrated system that recognizes the assets that we have and puts them in place? That takes planning, and that's something that there may be an opportunity for the state to work in concert with regional planning agencies, cities and towns, to amplify how we get people around without everyone driving their own vehicle you know, from place to place. I know, I, I know that you have a busy, busy schedule, and I promise to get you out of here on time. Closing thoughts on the race from now until? Um, yeah, I'm excited to come out of Worcester with the, with the win, the Democratic State Committee, and it's like a full-on sprint to September 6th. I do feel like, as someone who's been a municipal leader, a mayor of a city for the last 16 years, particularly a gateway city, um, it, it does provide me with a different level of experience than the other candidates in this race. I've had to put together budgets. I've had to manage the city through both the pandemic and recessions in the past. Um, as I mentioned, local government is where we educate kids, you know, work with our public safety leaders, invest in infrastructure and transportation and parks. Those are things that uh, other experiences that candidate, the candidate, other candidates in this race don't have. And I feel like it could be a real relevant skill to partner with our next governor to improve the quality of life in the places where people live. And frankly, I think that's what people are expecting out of state government. Right now, folks are feeling squeezed as prices are up. The, Massachusetts is a high cost state. And we might find the first time the next generation isn't going to do as well as their parents kids coming out of school with debt. Uh, I'm a public higher ed grad. I really want to be able to support our public higher ed institutions where 75 percent of our graduates remain in this commonwealth and make sure they think this place is not only where they can th thrive with a job, but they can afford to buy a home and raise their family. I'd, I'd love to be a partner with the next governor in doing that. I think this is really relevant experience that can help. And I'm super excited about the race and, and hoping people will give me consideration on September 6th. Mayor Kim Driscoll, thank you so much for joining us. My guest has been candidate for lieutenant governor, Kim Driscoll, current mayor of the city of Salem. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.